This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Welcome to the Richard Blackbee Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam and I'm your host. And this week on the podcast, we have Mark Clifton. He is the lead national strategist for revitalization and replanting at the North American Mission Board. God has used Mark to lead in the planting and replanting of more than a dozen churches across the United States and Canada. And we've actually broken this conversation up into two parts. So this is part one of Richard's conversation with Mark. Uh, Richard and Mark have actually uh, done a lot of conferences together and they speak across the country uh, in in various capacities and to associations. This is a great conversation uh, for anyone who's involved in a local church uh, in whatever capacity. They're going to talk a lot about churches that have plateaued or are in decline. Um, A large percentage of churches are, are in those categories. But even if your church is not in that category, there are some great insights as to what you can do, uh, signs to be looking for to avoid becoming a church that is plateauing or or declining. And here is part two of Richard's conversation with Mark Clifton. And I think that's a, you know, and and you know this, you you were involved with this. For years, we just thought, well, the, the action is in just, let's just plant new churches because because church plants do all those things. You have to, or else you'll never get off the ground. So you've got to get out in the community. You've got to be evangelistic and outward focused. And But but something happens. I, I, I don't know what that is, Mark. You know, you, you see a church that when it was planted, boy, they were in the community going door to door and being creative and trying new things and cutting edge. And then as a church goes on over the decades, something happens to it, like, like the church at Ephesus. You, like you said, they started off on fire, what 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 is that that happens to churches so often when they they, they typically they've got to they can't start out uh, lukewarm or they'll never they'll never survive you know through the birthing process but but somewhere along the line they start to cool off and uh, what what is it that causes churches to do that well it, it's obviously Satan it's obviously the adversary who 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 really is always at work he never ceases he's like a lion seeking whom he may devour I think we. We forget the adversary is always, he's working harder than we are. He's working harder to bring the church down than we're working to keep it up. And and he never he never quits working. And he's always trying to distract us and get us to really think that, that our agenda is Jesus's agenda. And so what happens is after we start, the church starts to grow. Sometimes you get your building and you start looking at your, and, and you just begin, we, we used to say that, you know, the church, when it, when it first starts, it's always so outwardly focused. And, and, and the structure within the church is just, it's just the bare minimum in order to get the work done. Everything is about outwardly focused. And then over time, that begins, this pendulum begins to shift. And before very long, if you're not intentional about it, everything is inwardly focused. All you got to do is look at your church budget hmm. and how much of your church budget is spent on ministry and outreach. How much of this spin on on things that may never really affect your personal members but the community as a whole and you know i'm not talking 10 to 15 percent why not 30 or 40 percent i mean we're here to we're here to be salt and light and so you look at your church budget you look at your church calendar you look at your church building are you ready for this Uh oh now you now you're getting how how many how (laughs) how how is your church building which is probably the for most churches it's the biggest asset they have right how is it blessing the community? How do you let the neighborhood use your church building? Hmm. I don't know of very many churches that don't have a kitchen and a fellowship hall, right? When was the last time somebody besides your church members used the kitchen and the fellowship hall? Hmm. When was the last time you let the neighborhood, somebody in your neighborhood come in and have a family reunion or a family gathering or a children's birthday party in your church? Even when I say that, people are like, that's just crazy, you know? You know that they can't. They could tear up our building. They could. Uh-huh. They could hurt our building. Again, you're you're just missing it. You want those people. You want to connect to them. And Mark, tell us. I mean, tell tell about the the, the church that that put installed those washing machines. Yeah, I had a, one of our one of our interns at Warnell, the church we replanted. Uh, he went up to a, a church in Wisconsin, and and like so many churches, they have these big Sunday school buildings that they really don't use anymore. The church was in decline. But again, it was like the other neighborhood I talked about. Well, it used to be large homes were now kind of cut up into duplexes and apartments. There were a lot of single parents, 
And most of these duplexes apartments didn't have washers and dryers. And so he became aware that these, especially these single moms that have to load up their kids, you know, once a week and put them in a car and, and, you know, put them in the car seat and thing and drive them to a laundromat of all places and, and sit there in, in the laundromat with a couple of little preschoolers and mm-hmm. try to keep them corralled while you're waiting to do the laundry. And, you know, there's no place for the kids to play and just took and he said you know what this is crazy we got this huge big building here let's just let's take a couple of these big Sunday school rooms and let's put in a bank of washers and dryers and then because they didn't have any children in Sunday school none and they said and I'll tell you what we'll, we'll just say every Saturday morning every Thursday night if you live in this neighborhood you can come and do your laundry here for free and we'll watch your kids yeah. and of course we're going to teach them about Jesus they're going to come to Bible school or Bible club or whatever you want to call it but I mean, they came, these single moms came, they, 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 even the, the, the families came because they got to do their laundry for free. It was in a nice, clean environment. The kids were well taken care of. And some of the, think about this, some of your older ladies could sit there and talk to these younger women and help them fold their clothes. And that's what I'm talking about. It, yeah. it's, it's how are you using your building? How are you sensing the needs in the community? There's no shortage of needs. And, and all you've got to do is just be be sensitive to those and say, how can we leverage our building? You know, I, I say all the time, if you got a bunch of empty rooms, take one of the rooms in your church, paint it up in real bright colors, put animals on the wall and <laughs> big carpet squares and, and make it a birthday party room, right? Hmm. And then tell the neighborhood, tell the, especially if you're in a lower income neighborhood where, you know, families don't really have the money to go have a big birthday party experience for their kids. Say, hey, we've got a birthday party room and you can use it absolutely free. And and maybe you've got some older ladies in your church that could actually make the cake and say, you know, we'd be glad to make a cake. It, it, I, yeah, you put it on. You, know, you got to have somebody to, you know, your members have to be there and host it. You can't let them be in the building without you being there. I, I get that. But that's OK. Have your members there to host it. Like, like I said. It's amazing how we'll have our members there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, one committee meeting, and there are no unchurched people at this stuff. All the meetings we're doing are for ourselves. And then we go, I wonder why our church is dying. Yeah. It really isn't that hard to figure out. Well, yeah. you know, and I, and I, I think a lot of churches, even I think so much of this message is great for churches that aren't necessarily in decline. But, but you know, you think about, and, and here in the South, especially in the summertime, you, you see a big uh, auditorium and, and perhaps they only have morning services. So they, they might meet once a week on Sunday morning, but they're literally spending hundreds of thousands of dollars just to air condition that building uh, through the summer. And you and when you look at the investment in that resource, it, you know, and you and I are not saying it's bad to have a building, but I just think a lot of churches realize we've got huge assets tied up in something we use for an hour and a half or so once a week. And uh, yep. sure, surely for the kingdom of God, there's a way to leverage a lot of the resources we have, whether it's a, you know, a, a, yep. a, a playground in our, on our property or a baseball field in the back 40 that we could we could put out there in the community somehow. And and and, and there are always those who immediately start thinking about liability. What if someone got hurt when they were in our property and so on? That's what insurance is for. <laughs> you, 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 know, you know, you always see I, I love I love the I love the churches that are dying or declining. And they put a chain across their parking lot and they, you know, they, and they say no skateboarding because I, I get it. Kids will play, they'll look for a place to skateboard and you don't, you know, I, I get it. You, you're afraid they'll fall, have some tragic injury. Right. And then the church gets sued. I, I get that. I understand that. But think, think about this with me. What if you, what if you took part of your parking lot or part of your property, you took some of that money you've got that 25, $30,000 you've got in case, you know, God forgets how to get to, to fund his church and you've got a second account back there so you can help him out when he needs it. So you've got that 30 or 40,000 there. What if you took that money and you built a really cool state of the art skateboard park? And then you, you went to an insurance company and you said, Hey, we want to insure this skateboard park. Yeah. It's going to be, you know, we're going to have to have millions of dollars worth of policy, but, but we can, we're going to, we're going to pay for that. And, and then you imagine when that neighborhood sees you care enough about kids to create, rather than to tell them don't skateboard on our property, you go, oh, we're going to give you a park and, and we're going to have it you know, made safe and we're going to have insurance here. And even now, when I say that, I know some people's heads are just exploding, but I'm, I'm telling you, that's, that's the difference between saying stay off our parking lot. Oh, by the way, let's put a chain across it and say, keep out. And then on Sunday, we'll take the chain down and say, y'all come in. 
I mean, that that's a mixed signal too, by yeah. the way. I remember uh, years ago, I, my, my boys were teenagers. They, they went over to the church, the parking lot with the church they went to they were, that we were members of. And they had a, a ghetto blaster back then playing some uh, cool music. They were playing basketball. They had non-church, uh, Christian friends. They were playing with them. And, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a dear saintly old lady came out and chastised them for, you know, the, the rambunctious, loud music being played and so on. And the, 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 it, this was during the weekday when nothing was going on in the church, but a bunch of people, uh, kids, teenagers, are actually enjoying the property and fellowship. And there's some Christians involved in that. And they, you just thought, and of course, it just turned people off. They're all the my, my kids' friends. Their their impression of church was a bunch of grumpy people that don't want you coming on their property unless you're sitting quietly in a in a church service or something like that. And so many missed opportunities that uh, you're great at, um, at at highlighting, and and you've just seen so many creative ways in which people have uh, made use of their facility and and penetrate into the community to make a difference. Well, we, uh, there's a church I was working with for about a year that was in decline and about ready to close. And they had two buildings. They had the sanctuary. Well, they had the old sanctuary. And then right next to it, they built a new sanctuary back in the 50s. And they turned the old sanctuary into an education building. So you got you got two buildings side by side, all right? And then they're connected by a, an outdoor walkway, right? So the area between, it was always just sort of, you know, left unkept. It, it just it looked kind of weird and everything. Well, when when this church was replanted, and we, we got another church that was meeting in a high school nearby that was full of young people, full of new converts. Finally, this church determined that they were going to let themselves be adopted by the new church. So the new church came in, completely transformed the building. First thing that new church did, I was so proud of this church planner. He made that area between the two buildings, this cool courtyard. They strung those cool, you know, outdoor lights back and forth across it. They put all kinds of cool tables in a fire pit there. And they let the community come in the evening and just enjoy this really cool courtyard. That area had stayed there at that church for 60 years with nothing done to it. Just a new set of eyes saying the community could come and just enjoy this place. And, and then I just noticed this week, he took an area behind the church and they built a huge sand volleyball court, right? Mm. Because, and it, just that whole concept, we're doing this not for ourselves, but for the community. That church had that property since the 19, and of course now I'm, the church is absolutely growing, reaching people, baptizing people, loving the community, very much a part of the community. So, if that church were to close tomorrow and all that were to go away, even the people who don't go to church there would notice, hey, something we've lost something in our community because these people are no longer here. Yeah, and you know, I think uh, that's such a great point. Whether you're a declining church or not, just any church saying, do, how, how, how are we viewed by our community? Do they, wh wh what's their impression of us? And, it, and I've known pastors who've, who've gone door to door and just uh, said, hey, w w what's your impression of that, that church? And I, I remember one time, I think you, you and I were somewhere where, uh, a pastor had done that and said, what's your impression of that, that church up there in the, at the top of the street there? And, and neighbors were saying, oh, I think that closed down. I don't think they meet anymore. <laughs> or I had one say, I thought that was a school. And they didn't even, know, <laughs> didn't even know it was a church. Yeah, I know. It's, it's amazing how that, that um, yeah, you know, we're not even, we're, we're not, not even, remotely part of the fabric of the community and, I, and i'm not sure what happens because i know back but you, you know, have to be intentional you know in the 50s 60s people would walk to church uh, in, in large part and now it, now they become sort of more regional where even even churches of uh, you know 200 or less uh, most of the people are driving in from other neighborhoods they, they're not from that neighborhood anymore and uh, by the way maybe just i, I know this is a real uh you know, important thing for you, but, but you don't usually even use the word small church. You typically use the word normative church. And what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think, I think, well, the, the term small church, that, that identifier, if you look back in writings a hundred years ago in the early 1900s, you know, church writings and, and, you know, church denominations, they didn't talk about small church. They talk about church and, and really, uh, 80% of all churches in North America have less than 175 on Sunday morning. 
Well, if, if you're 80% of a group, you're not small, you're just normal. It's a normative sized church. Hmm. And so we, we have an issue where we, we look at the very, very small number. In our, in our group of Southern Baptists, uh, the churches that average more than 2,000 a weekend are less than 2%. Less than 2%. I mean, that's, that's amazing when you think that 98% are not at 2,000 or more a weekend. And yet we, we seem to want to compare everything to the, to the big church. Well, we're just a small church. You're, you're, you're a church of 50 people. That's 50, I mean, a church of 50 people in a neighborhood can do amazing things. But if you say, well, we're just a small church, we can let the big churches do it, then, then that's a limiting factor. Hmm. And so I don't, I don't want you to think of yourself as a small church. You're a normal-sized church in terms of churches around the globe, in terms of the church really for all of since Christ founded the church. The vast majority of churches have been less than 100, 150 people gathered uh, together for worship. That's just a normative-sized church, and God can do amazing things through normative-sized churches. So we really have to change our concept of that. Otherwise, we just say, well, we would try to start do the skateboard part, skateboard park, or we would maybe do washers and dryers in the building. We would maybe, but you know, we're not a big church. We're just a small church. You're not a small church. Huh. You're like most churches in the world. If every church your size said, well, we can't do it, then nothing would get done. Yeah. I mean, and what God going, can do amazing things. Well, and I mean, the, the mega churches that we are familiar with now, is a, are, they're a relatively a new phenomenon. Uh, that, you know, it used to be churches ministered to a region, or, or I mean, to a neighborhood, to a community, and that, that was their focus. They weren't trying to pull people from all over the area. They just wanted to make sure that they ministered to their neighborhood. And, you know, I'd love, maybe just tell us a little bit. I've been to the, you're, you are pastoring, a, you, you, you've pastored a number of churches over the years, but you're pastoring a church in Linwood, Kansas right now that uh, I've been to. And uh, I love that story because they were down to, I think, three people. And they, yeah. and that when you're down to three and you're in a, and the, the whole community is not very big to start with. Um, right. And I, I love just some of the, what, just tell us some of the things your little church that began at three, yeah. what, what you've yeah. done in the community and what you've offered to the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, we're, we're down, we're down, they were down of three remaining members and uh they asked me to be their pastor and uh uh that was two years ago this month and the town has 400 people in it and uh so it's just a little town of 400 people uh it, it has a, a gas station and a tavern <laughs> we did get a dollar general at christmas so we were really excited <laughs> you call that, that you call that the mall i think there i call it the mall yeah <laughs> I'll call it there but it's, it's, it's just 400 people uh, the Methodist Church closed a long time ago, and so the Baptist Church was going to close as well. But, but uh, they they agreed to stay open, and and God's done a really wonderful work of revitalizing that church. And and we we have between sixty and seventy five every Sunday morning now, and we baptized seven people, baptized two this past Sunday, and uh, it's just it's just exciting to see God work. He listen, you know, when the Apostle Paul was discouraged and 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 down. God came to him and said, stop being afraid. He, he didn't say don't, the, the actual, I think the actual Greek is stop it. Like he was, he was afraid. Stop being afraid. And I have many people in this place, this town you don't know about. And I think, I think, you know, Jesus was at work in Linwood before I ever showed up. And so when, when I showed up and some other people came along with me and we began to love the neighborhood and care for that neighborhood and serve the neighborhood, when we first got there, we weren't trying to grow the church numerically. We were trying to bless the community. Hmm. The church had been there for 110 years, and in many ways, it had never really done that. It had always been like, we're the Baptist church. You come to us. You know, we, we're, the, we're the Baptist in town. You come to us. It's like, well, that doesn't work anymore. And, hmm. and, and besides, the church has been in a town for 110 years, a small town. It's probably offended everybody twice in one way or another. <laughs> And so in a small town, if you offended them, it's like, you know, it happened yesterday, even if it happened 20 years ago. So we, we had to dig ourselves out of a hole and we did it by serving people, mowing people's yards, having festivals and parades and bringing in the mascot from the Kansas City Chiefs and letting him, you know, visit with all the kids. And, and I mean, having concerts in the town, uh, giving free guitar lessons, giving free Zumba classes having free garage sales. I mean, it, this past Sunday, uh, we had an after-school party at the end of the school year party. We had snow cones and cotton candy and bounce houses. And 
just so that the you know the people in the community know that this church really does love them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and in in response to that, the Lord's been working on some folks in that community. And once they realized there was a church there that was really more interested in them than themselves, you know, a lot of people think the church. You you say, hey, come see us. It's like some business saying, hey, come buy our product. Mm-hmm. And people, are, I don't I don't need what you're selling. You know, I don't need a church. They don't even know they need the church. Yeah. And uh, and so yeah, you just we just went in and 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 so it's just been a wonderful thing to see um as a like there's one young man that's been coming to our church he's a single dad and uh the lord's really been growing him in his faith and i i'm just really impressed with him and he found out that that uh that uh, anyway i don't want to get into all of it on a on a podcast but anyway he 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 has custody of his of his little daughter and uh, he was so excited. She's like eight, eight, nine years old. And he was so excited. He called me last week. And she, she, he had led her to Christ. She'd oh. made her profession of faith in Jesus. So son, this past Sunday, I, I got to baptize her. Mm. And he was there and just beaming. And I mean, here, yeah, it's a normative size church. It's 50 or 60 people. But for that single dad and that little girl, it is the most important thing in, the, in, in all eternity is that that church is there for them. Yeah. And and I remember a Sunday, I, I as I stood there with her, we have this little hot tub, so we use for our baptistry. So the hot tub was up on the platform, and and I stood there with her, and and, I, and you know talked to her, to her to the congregation about her commitment to follow Jesus, and and I just said, Kylie, you see all these these people out here, this is your church family, and they love you. And I mm-hmm. said, hey everybody, just say hey Kylie, and I go hi Kylie, and I go Kylie, these people are going to love you and grow you in the gospel. This is a family you have, and. Hmm. That's what the church is all about. You don't need 4,000 people to do that. <laughs> and, and you need 40 or 50. And they're going to love Kylie, and she's going to love them, and it's going to be a great place to go. So you can tell I get excited about uh-huh. it. So even a church of three in a town of 400 can be a wonderful place to be if mm. Jesus is the leader of that church and you follow what he wants you to and, do. And I know if you, if anyone knows Mark, you know that he's a bluegrass uh, fan, yes. big time big bluegrass fan. You, you, yeah. you told me you're going to get me a collection of the, of the greatest uh, to, to try to help uh, need to you do that. lead me yeah, into the, I do. So we've had some two, point. Yeah. We had two or three bluegrass festivals in the three, two years we've been there. We're getting to have our third this fall. And the first one we had was on the old football field, and we had we had well over 400 people show up. It was wow. amazing, and in a town of 400, I mean, it was people came all across the county. Now uh, we had a really some really good bands, and you know, hey, people were saying, "Where'd you get the money for that?" Well, you know, you 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 find it. I mean, you know, one time R.C. Sproul asked his students. How much ministry can you do for a hundred dollars? And they didn't answer because they all thought it was a trick question. And <laughs> with a big old belly laugh, he said, well, "You can do a hundred dollars worth." And so his point was, you know, as as a pastor, as a leader, you, you've got to you got to be able to go out there and and find resources, and resources flow toward activity. So I I just you know I did I went and talked to all the churches in the county. I spent a lot of my time trying to talk to them and saying, here's what we want to do in Linwood. Will we see God leading us? Here's what I'm doing in Linwood. And, and, and a few of them began to help us and then a few more. And then when they see the results after a while, they come to us and they say, Hey, mm-hmm. how can we pour more fuel on this fire? Wow. And so I, I really think we use the idea that well, we can't have those things because we don't have any money. Well, have, have you asked and have you asked again and again, and have you prayed and asked other people to pray and, I mean, mm. the Lord will provide what He needs to provide. He's yeah. more than capable of doing that. And I, I think that's just such an important word, to, especially if you're in a small, uh, in a normative sized church, is to quit, quit focusing on what you can't do, what you can't afford to do, and look at what God has put in your hands. What you, what, what can you do? And it, it might just be, you know, popcorn and and snow cones outside the the school on the last day, and say, hey, we just want to celebrate with you, Gret, you know, finishing up another year. You, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be massive. You, you might not be able to start out with a bluegrass concert, but what can you do? Uh, and, and so maybe just one last word, uh, Mark. Th- there are people uh, probably listening to this that they're, they're, they're immediately thinking of their church and they're thinking, well, you know, we, we're not dying yet, but uh, boy, I tell you what, there's just so much more we could be doing in our community or we're not using our facility right. Or I'm, I'm afraid my church is pretty inward focused and, uh, but maybe they're not the pastor; they're just church members. And uh, but but you've just listening to you today. They've they've got a burden now to say our church should do more. Is there any 
uh, advice or encouragement you'd give people listening that want their church to be that kind of church that makes a difference in their community? Well, yeah, I, absolutely. We started Linwood. The first thing we did was go to experiencing God. Hmm. I mean, that that's, that's, that's the beginning point, because as I said, you know, as, as the Lord told, told Paul, I got many people in this place. I mean, I, we went into Linwood and, and the remaining members were like, we're ready to close because nobody's responding to us. It's like, no, that's no, no, no. There, there are 400 souls in this little town. Trust me, the Holy Spirit's working on all of them. I mean, mm-hmm. he is at work in all their lives and, and we just got to join him in, in, in that activity. And so we didn't begin at Linwood with, uh, well, here's our plan. Here's, here's how it works someplace else. We began with experiencing God. Mm-hmm. And I invite some other people to come in and go through that with us. And in, in that experiencing God, we built into the DNA of the church a belief that this is Jesus' church and he has a plan for it. And our, our first task is to be so intimately connected to Jesus that we understand his plan and we're willing to follow his plan. So that's really the starting place. I mean, and even if you've been through experiencing God, you, you can go through it again. It's uh-huh. perfectly okay. You know, you go, and, and now you've and got a, a new brand version, new yeah. version. Yeah. So yeah. do experiencing God. And then we did flickering lamps. We did those two things. Hmm. And at that point, then we just say, okay, um, Okay, here's our little budget. We got, I think we had nine thousand dollars when we started the whole. That's, that's what we inherited from the church. So, I mean, that's not much money when you got to pay utilities and and all that stuff, uh, and a lot of work needed to be done on the building. But then you know, we just say, okay, but but if if we wanted to have uh, some events in the community, if we wanted to do these, how much might that cost? And and we put the list there, and we go, okay, well, if if that's where's that money going to come from? And we just began to pray, and I began to ask the Lord to open my eyes and show me places that, that it could happen. And and so I, I just think you, you start living by faith at that point. But I think it begins with really being willing to lay down your agenda and follow Jesus' agenda mm-hmm. uh, and not look at some other church and say, well, we can copy what they're doing, but say, what does Jesus specifically have? And listen, one of the first things he's going to have you do is quit doing some things you're doing. Yeah. Because you got to make room for what he wants to do. You can't just you can't just squeeze it in. There's probably some things you're doing that are not making disciples, are not seeing people come to Jesus. They're just taking up space and time, and it, you've got to be willing to to lay everything aside and say we'll we'll follow what you want. Now, in terms of resources, like I said, you know, experiencing God, and and certainly um, uh, flickering lamps. Where our website is Church Replanters. That's plural. Church Replanters dot com. There's plenty of good resources on there as well. And all kinds of and videos. Uh, and mention your book too, because you you tied oh. that into the glory of God. And I think that's a great. Yeah, great I, I, our book is our book is called Reclaiming Glory. It's a, a Lifeway or Broadman Holman publication. It's coming out again in 2023, early 2023. Uh, it's a revised version that comes out with brand new stories. So if you if you have Reclaiming Glory. Uh, good for you, but uh, you'll want to get the new version because about half the book is examples. And so what we did is we we came in last year with brand new examples, just like I talked about at Linwood. So some brand new stories and also a video series that goes with it. So that'll be in 2023, in early 2023. Mm-hmm. But right now you can look up Reclaiming claiming Glory because we basically, we do all this for God's glory. Nothing else. Mm-hmm. Well, I, uh, Mark, I knew that the time would fly by, and uh, I, there's just so much that Mark is doing. And I, I'm so encouraged uh, because he, he, his team is going into some hard places and seeing, and, and God is reclaiming his glory. And as you said, there, there's nothing about a dying, declining church that brings glory to God. And, uh, and, but, but when you see a church that was on the ropes, was uh, facing closure, and now it's vibrant and growing and reaching its community and being a blessing— that brings a lot of glory to God. And so God's got a vested interest in turning churches around and, and helping them be all the church that he intended when he created them in the first place. And, uh, and so there's lots of good stuff going on. You, 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 as you listen uh, to this podcast, you might not have heard those stories, but they're happening and, uh, in, in, in neighborhoods and places that you, you, you'd be surprised if you saw the awesome things God's doing. And so we'll put links uh, to the various books that uh, that were mentioned and to Mark's website. Mark's got a number of uh, podcasts that he does. So if you're a pastor and you just need some encouragement, he's got. Give us a quick summary here, Mark, before we go, just to, just to catch <laughs> we, you on a, on yeah, a podcast each I week. Do. 
Sure. I do one with Tom Rainer every week, comes out every Thursday. It's a podcast and a YouTube show. It's a revitalize and replant. We've done about 300 of them. So you can go to revitalize and replant.com and there you'll find a whole library of all, all kinds of stuff about revitalization and replanting. And then a, another one I do with a, a friend of mine named Andy Addis, who pastors a really large multi-site rural church here in Kansas. Andy He's in Hutchinson, Kansas, which is a town about 30,000 people, but he has 15 or 16 campuses across Kansas in towns of 1,000, 700, 1,500. Every weekend, Andy will have 3,000 people uh, worship in his network of churches. So Andy and I have a podcast called the Rural Pastor Podcast, hmm. and you can find it as well. So the Rural Pastor Podcast, where every week we talk to pastors in rural settings, and then revitalize and replant with Tom Rayner. And you got Mondays, uh, Mondays with Mark, too, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I have Mondays with Mark on Facebook. And so uh, <laughs> you, you can go to Church Replanters Facebook page. And all the Mondays with Mark are there. It's something I do every Monday night. It's about 15 or 20 minutes of just musing about anything revitalization on so, Mondays with Mark. So well, I, I do that too. There is all kinds of resources. I hope you'll check them out. And Mark, thank you for giving us time. I know you, you got in late last night and I we got you going early this morning, but really appreciate that. So excited about how God's using you and your team. And, uh, and I, I really encourage people uh, if you've heard this message, look at your church and ask the Lord, uh, what fresh new thing do you want to do in our church that will make us more relevant, more impactful, more fruitful than we've ever been before? So thanks, yep. Mark, and I look forward to being with Thank you. you once again. All right, buddy. Luck. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners, so email us at podcast at blackme.org.